What elements make up a great story? Well, I think when you're when you're writing and you're, you sort of have an idea and you go, wow, will this actually make a great feature film or not? Um, I usually think about, okay, are these three elements part of the idea? Or could I find a way to sort of embed these three elements? Um, and one is that it needs to have a main character who wants something really badly. And um, the second one is it has to promise lots of conflict. Like when we imagine the story and we imagine what the character wants and what they're going to have to do to get it, we already start to kind of imagine all the crazy obstacles that that person's going to have to face in order to get what they want. And then we get really interested, right? And then third, I think a way to tell if your um, idea will make a great movie is um, does it have human emotions in it that we can relate to? You know, even if you're writing about science fiction or you're writing a horror movie or something set way in the past where you really have no um, immediate connection to the time or place or characters, there have to be those human feelings and desires and fears that we can relate to. You know, so I always think those are the three criteria that make a great movie or TV idea. Um, and obviously, if you're writing a TV show, you know, the idea has to promise lots of story. You know, when you're writing a feature, it's a contained three-act structure, right? So it has, it's, it's a contained story with an end. So, um, you know, thinking about that idea, the, all those elements still have to be at play. And then in addition, when you're writing a TV limited series or a TV um, show with multiple seasons, you know, how are all those characters and all those conflicts going to spool out? and promise lots of conflict to come. Yeah. Great, great three tips. Uh, first off, how would we know that the character's want is really strong enough that it warrants us being invested in them? Right. Well, as a story consultant, I mean, I work with a lot of screenwriters. I work with professional screenwriters who are working in the industry, and I also work with beginning people and people who are kind of in the middle of their journey toward being a professional screenwriter. Um, but even with the, the professional screenwriters that I work with, it's always the same. It's like every time I read the script, it's like, what do they want? And the writer looks at me like, I have no idea. <laughs> like they've written a whole script and they're just, they still kind of don't understand what the main character wants. And so when someone is thinking about their, their main character, you know, I always like to break down what they want into two parts. Like they have an emotional need, like to find love or connection or for revenge or power or whatever. And then there's a specific immediate goal that they pursue in the story that satisfies that emotional need. So if you don't have those two things and know them pretty clearly, you're probably gonna write a lot of pages that you don't end up having in your final version of the script. Because, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but I've written full scripts where I literally have no idea what they want. And this happens, this happens, this happens, and then I look at the script and I'm like, what is this? Like, what is this thing? Why should I be invested in watching this story? So I think a way to know if, you, if your character has enough of an engine to drive a feature or a television show, is like they have to have a very specific emotional need and then they have a very specific goal that they're pursuing in the story to satisfy that need. Now, when they start the movie or the TV show, that immediate goal that they're pursuing could be like the wrong thing, right? And their goal changes. But usually the emotional need stays constant. As they sort of grow, then they may change that, that immediate goal to kind of reveal their, their growth as a character or whatever. But like, you know, do you know what your character emotionally needs and wants? And then what is it that they specifically decide to do to satisfy that need? And once you have that lined up, then you're good. You're good to go and start writing. With conflict, how do we know how much, how, like, is it too much too soon or there can never be too much conflict too soon? Like, you know, some people think they have conflict in their story and it's actually not, it, it's too, it's too meek. It's not, it's not enough. Right. That's a great question about conflict. Um, for me, like even if you're writing the most small, specific character driven movie that takes place in a very kind of, um, small location with just a few characters, 
there has to be lots of conflict. There needs to be internal conflict and external conflict of some kind. However, that doesn't mean your, your movie has to start with like conflict, 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 too much conflict because after a while it's like, whoa, what is this? What's happening here? What's this about? So um, one way to sort of um, think about conflict and how it works, especially when you're when you're writing a feature film, is that you know at the beginning of the story your character may want something that they don't have, right? And they're just kind of living their life, but we get the sense that they want something that they don't have. And then there is this inciting incident or call to adventure where maybe they have the chance to get what they want, but it's like super scary, right? Like there's something emotionally dangerous about that call or physically dangerous. And so they go, nope, I'm gonna refuse that call because I'm too afraid. And then something usually happens to kind of force the person to take action and heed the call to adventure and go on the journey at the end of act one. So it's not like you have to have conflict, conflict, conflict. You know, it's like, like usually most really great stories, um, depending on what genre you're writing in. I mean, if you're writing an action movie, there should be something big up top, right? And then it creates a question and we're like, what happened? And then we slow down and we start to go meet up with the character and what they're trying to figure out. Um, so you can have sections of your script that are quiet where we're just kind of revealing character and they're still trying to get what they want, but the conflicts are smaller and more internal. Um, but in the climax of your movie, whether you're writing a tiny movie or you're writing a huge movie, you know, where there's car chases and explosions or whatever, that is the moment where there has to be big conflict, either emotionally or physically. So conflict is something that um, you have to kind of modulate throughout the script. Right, and um, there are moments in the story that are quieter, where maybe we get in act two, we have a moment where everything kind of slows down and we have a scene with two characters connecting on a deeper emotional level that then create bigger stakes so that when they move into the next section of conflict, the stakes are even higher, just because we had this really t tiny, quiet little scene that had no conflict in it. So each scene has to move the story forward and conflict will kind of ebb and flow, but there always has to be tension in the story. And um, the reason for that is that, you know, every, every movie, every TV show, every story creates a dramatic question, you know? And the dramatic question is, will the person get what they want or not? And that's what holds us to the story. And so if somebody has a goal and they go after it and they get it, we're like, okay, the story's over. Like, you know, um, but if they want something and it's really hard, either emotionally or physically, we're gonna keep watching because if we, are, if we have empathy toward that character and we understand what they want and why, we generally want them to get it and so we're with them. And that question of will they get it or will they not get it is what holds us to the story. And in order for us, for that question to kind of be um, dramatic and suspenseful, we need conflict. Yeah. And so what if the character gets what they want early in the film, mm -hmm. but it turns out that didn't really fulfill their desired need? And we as the viewer go on this journey to see them get it and we want to root for them and think, oh, wow, they have it. But then it turns out to be either a disappointment or, um, you know, traumatic to their lives. Right. And so then we follow the rest of the film of them trying to sort out this this goal. Right. So, so yeah, like that, that happens a lot in storytelling, right, where the character... Um, remember when I was talking about that idea that they that they have this emotional need and then they have this specific goal and they pursue the wrong goal. Like, for example, let's just take um, a rom a teen rom com, just because that's an easy genre to talk about. So, so a trope in rom coms, especially in the teen sort of world, is that that let's say we have a female character and she loves the wrong boy. She loves Kevin. Kevin is the popular boy. <laughs> Kevin has the swoopy hair. Kevin has the letterman's jacket, right? And um, she wants Kevin so bad. And we, the audience, are going, actually, it's Joe, the nerdy guy that's for you. But, but she has to figure it out herself. So let's say she gets together with Kevin. And, and she's with Kevin, and she's starting to realize, like, oh, 
this isn't really good. Like, I don't really li like him or I don't really be like being part of this, this, this crowd or whatever, you know. She's starting to realize who she really loves, which is Joe. But like she rejected Joe way back there. So now Joe is with Sally. And now she has to try to get Joe back. Like it becomes, it, beco it can become part of you creating an arc for your main character. And they sort of get a deeper understanding of what it is they really want you know, that's related to their emotional need for love and connection. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it does. It does. <laughs> okay. And I'm sorry, the third part was, are there enough emotions? Do we feel empathetic toward the character? Yeah. Okay. So, so do we, so creating empathy, I mean, for those of your, um, your viewers who are writing, you know, we all know that the one thing we really need to create between the audience and the main character is empathy. And empathy, um, to me, empathy is sharing the feelings and understanding why someone's doing something and recognizing those motives as human in yourself. So even if you have an antagonist who's like doing despicable, disgusting, horrible things, if we know why that person is doing it, they feel like a real person, right? And they're humanized and they don't feel stereotypical or villainy, you know, like twirling their mustaches. Um, and with a main character, empathy is, is really important too, because again, if we're sharing the emotions of our main care of the main character in the story, they're actually the window through which we're experiencing the journey. So, you know, the, the, the function of the hero in storytelling is for the reader or the audience to actually be in that person's situation and experience that journey through their eyes. And so in order to do that, we have to feel a connection to that person. So um, a lot of times, you know, students or writers ask me like, I wanna write an anti-hero. Like, I, my, no, my main character's not likable. I don't care, they're not gonna be likable. And I'm like, great. They don't have to be likable, but they do have to be empathetic. In other words, we have to understand their motives, why they're doing what they're doing. And so most main characters are likable, you know, like we we like them and we want them to get what they want. But there are some main characters, um, like in The Talented Mr. Ripley, I don't know if you've seen that movie, but um, Tom Ripley is does terrible things. And I don't wanna do spoiler, I think everybody needs to watch this movie, it's one of my favorite movies. Especially if you want to have a main character who who does bad things, but we're still connected to him and we're still watching him going, don't do it, Tom. You know, it's just like, don't. But we know what he wants because it's set up so clearly at the beginning that we feel for him and we understand him. And we are riveted by his journey because as he does one terrible thing after another, we keep wanting him to have a chance to take it all back and to make the right choice. And so, even though he's an anti-hero, we're like, please don't do anything bad. Please cho make choose the person who loves you. Oh, he didn't choose. You know, it's just it's a brilliant movie because we 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 hate the guy, but we have complete empathy for that person. And you know, if we're connected to the character that way, we will follow that person to the end of the movie or the end of the TV show because we're interested. We, we, and we care and we understand why they're doing what they do. Pat, at what point does empathy have to be present in the story? So if we have a character that's unlikable, but eventually we determine, okay, we understand why they're doing what they're doing. Is there a certain point where the empathy meter has to kick in for the audience? Yeah, I actually think the empathy meter has to kick in on page one. Like that connection needs to be established immediately in the story. Um, and if it's not, it, we're gonna struggle to connect to that person and follow them, especially if they're kind of an anti-hero main character. Um, so for example, in, in The Talented Mr. Ripley, where Tom Ripley is an anti-hero, um, the, the filmmaker and the writer, um, I think it's Anthony Mangala, works really hard on page one to establish why he wants what he wants. Um, he wants to be seen by people in power. He wants to play music. And he's basically living in poverty 
and um, we see him in this environment and we see him yearning to be part of this glittery rich crowd and so because we are so connected to him around that because all of us have been wanting to be part of something that maybe we can never be part of right we can all relate to that and so later when he starts doing terrible things to stay part of that group that that glittery crowd we totally understand why he's doing it and it's so deeply embedded in our understanding of the character that he can pretty much do anything and we will still follow him through this story so no matter what kind of movie you're writing even if it's an anti-hero type of movie um, you have to establish that connection or that understanding pretty quickly in the, in the story. What is the mystery that sometimes makes writing seem so daunting? <laughs> if only I knew what the mystery was. There's so many mysteries. Um, okay, so the way I look at writing is like there's the craft, right? There's the things that you can learn, you know, like how to create a great character, like what's three act structure, um, how to write a great scene, you know, what's good dialogue, how to tell a visual story, all that kind of stuff. You can kind of learn that stuff, right? And you can, you can sort of absorb it and practice it and get better at it. Um, but the second half of writing is this weird alchemy. And I love that you described it as magical because it is magic. It feels like magic sometimes. And, um, sometimes you can't control that magical side like this other side that's like i made an outline and i have my act breaks and here's the midpoint like that you can control on the page but the part of writing that uses the right side of your brain that is really holistic and intuitive and connecting it's it feels like magic because at times when i at least when i'm writing i feel like i'm literally just taking dictation from someone that i'm just typing these people are talking to me and i'm writing down what they what they say and there are other times where i'm writing scenes where it's like enter scene she wants this she does this to get it there is so it's very kind of like practical you know um, and i think it's this magical what we call the magical side of writing that makes it feel really, really daunting and something that we cannot control. And that, you know, we want to be able to go, every time I sit down to write, it's magical, you know, and it's not. And the one thing that I've discovered um, about the magical side of writing is that it won't happen unless you're sitting in the chair, you know, and, and it's not there the whole time, you know, and it does seem daunting because you can't control it. But if you put in the work, if you sit in the chair, if you show up every day and create that time, you know, for me, like if I work at the same time every day, that becomes magic because I have created a ritual where I sit down, I turn on my computer, I have my coffee, you know, um, I post a writing quote every morning. So I look and I find a writing quote that applies to me. What am I struggling with today? And then I find that quote and then I post it. And then I sit down and I start to write. And because I've created these routines around my writing, the magic is attracted to it. And so it doesn't always go well. I mean, you know, I have days where I write nothing or I write one page and it's really bad and I know it's bad. But I found that this idea that it's daunting can actually take on its own dark power. You know, that there's this thing out there and it's magic. And I don't have access to it because writing for me is hard. It's hard for everyone, you know? It's hard. How many drafts have you written of this thing? You still have to try to find that, that, that thing that once it clicks, it's like, oh, I found it, you know? But in order to attach to that magic, you have to actually be sitting in your chair and just showing up every single day. Um, so, and I, I love that you men mentioned um, Richard Walter earlier um, in our comments because he was my screenwriting teacher. But he used to he used to say this this thing in class, which I thought was really great, which is um, there's no such thing as writer's block. That is something that we actually create in our minds as a way of avoiding facing things in our writing or in our script. If we're writing about something that's really emotionally close to us. 
you know, it's like suddenly writing becomes really hard and now I'm worried about the person I'm writing about and they're going to read the script and I need to change the character. And, you know, I think as writers, we have to stop thinking about it as writer's block because we create the block. We create the block because of other things that are going on. And so, you know, all we have to do and all we really can do is show up in the chair and write. And again, this is just my experience. I'm sure other writers have had different experiences. The magic does not come very often at all, but when it comes, it's like amazing. And suddenly things start to make sense and you didn't understand what the script was about and why is this character doing this thing? Suddenly you go, oh my God, this is why she's doing it. And this is what she would do next because she wants, you know, and so that, that, that connective side of your, of your brain is the magic, I think. And in order to let it do its job, you just have to drag your left side of your brain that made the outline into the chair and work diligently and, ho and just wait for it to come, you know? So thunder's not going to crash outside your window while you're, I mean, not every time, it maybe may. once, okay. I actually find thunder crashes inside me. Like my anxiety is its own daunting thing to deal with around writing, you know? And if I could, if I could tame my anxiety and really get it under control, um, I feel like the dauntingness of writing would be far lessened for me. You know, and I don't know, I'm sure other writers struggle with anxiety as well, but it's super, it, it can be very, it can take over your brain and then you start thinking about other things and stuff. And so again, creating those rituals where you sit down at your desk and you have your cup of coffee or your tea or whatever, and you have little colored pencils, like that you really make it almost religious, you know, because what happens is when you, you create those patterns, the minute you sit down, your brain starts to go into that mode of like, now it's writing time. Now I'm gonna write, you know? Um, so um, yeah, I don't think you can depend on inspiration or like a thunderstorm to inspire you or whatever. Um, you just have to be diligent and show up um, and, and do the work. You know, it's, it's great because I, I have this quote here that we were saving for the end, but it, it's funny that I chose this. Um, I saw on your blog that you love Joan Didion. Yeah. And that you were watching a documentary. I think she's had at least one or two. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, so she says here, don't, or excuse me, do not whine, do not complain, work harder, spend more time alone. And this is from her 2011 memoir, Blue Nights. Yes. So yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of fitting. Yes. It sounds like that, it. I, that's weird that I chose. That's it. Yeah. the truth. Mm -hmm. That is the truth in that one sentence. You know, as writers and um, especially as women, you know, um, like it's hard to find time alone, and it's hard to prioritize your writing. You know, especially if you're still working in a regular job and you're trying to sort of. Um, you're writing, but it's, it, you have kids or a family or whatever, you know, it's very hard to prioritize that alone time. But if you don't do it, you won't get the work done, you know? And so um, I love what she says about work hard, carve that space out in your life to be alone. Because in order to get your pages done, you really do have to be alone. And you do, you know, whether you like music playing or whatever, environment you like to write in, you have to act like it's really important and you have to prioritize it because if you don't, it'll be the first thing to get shoved away. You know, when my, when my kids, I mean, they're young adults now, I, had, I have two boys, but when they were babies, I used to just set my coffee pot to like 4 a.m. I would set my coffee pot, I would set my alarm, I would get up at 4 a.m., it was completely quiet, everybody was asleep. I would go into the kitchen, I would get my cup of coffee and I would just go into the den and I would write until six. And then everyone started screaming and crying and needing me and then I could start my day and I could do meetings or whatever I had to do. But I had carved out that time in the darkness by myself with a single lamp on with my computer to get my work done. Now, I was wiped out by 4 p.m. Like I was like a live, like a zombie walking through my life. But I kind of arranged my day so that I didn't really need to do anything um, that required a lot of thought at the end of the day, you know? So it worked out for me. Um, but 
at first it was really hard to make that commitment and go, I'm getting up at four in the morning because it was just like, oh, these kids are killing me. Oh my God. You know, it's just motherhood was like a big, a big thing. And, um, I just found when I, when I had those two hours in the morning, got my work done, I was so much happier the rest of the day. Um, I interacted with my children in a positive way. And most importantly, I got, I got my pages done, you know, um, and so how do you carve out that alone, alone time? Do you need to actually get out of your house? You know, sometimes your house is so busy that there's no way to work there. So is there a coffee shop that you love where you can go and just sit there with your latte and, you know, stay there for an hour and a half? Um, one thing that, I, that I've read about, which is really interesting and help, hopefully helpful for the people who um, are your viewers, is that um, they've done studies where people who write at the same time every day and create this pattern, this habit, are much more productive and tend to finish their projects. Um, Maya, Maya Angelou used to, um, she couldn't work in her house, so she would like, she had a, a room reserved at a hotel. And like, she would show up there at 9 a.m. in her little hotel room, she would write until noon, get her pages done, and then in the afternoon, she'd go to lunch, do whatever she, you know, if she had meetings or whatever she needed to do or read, you know, whatever she needed to do in the afternoons she could do. But she, her, she went to her office, like in this hotel room and created that ritual for herself away from her family so that she could get her work done. What about the stigma of, well, you're being selfish because people yeah. need you? Yeah. <sighs> this <laughs> not, is not a small lava. question. <laughs> my friend Meg Lafove talks about lava all the time, which I think is so great because it's, it's that emotional stuff that triggers you and that stops you and... You know, when you're writing about it in your story, it's like it's alive for you, maybe not even in a positive way because it's so triggering or whatever. Um, does Do people say it's selfish for people to go to the bank and work as a teller? Do people say it's selfish to, um, hello, kitty. Sorry, now I'm feeling, I love she it. usually is quiet. It's she almost wants like, to join the conversation. I know, I think she's saying, mama. I love I it. She, what about the idea that it's selfish to set time for oneself for something like writing when people might need you? Well, people are always going to need you. And I think the thing that we all have to struggle with as writers is finding that time for ourselves. And like I said, really prioritizing it and believing in ourselves that it is important. And so I always wonder like, you know, does anyone say like the guy who goes to work at the bank is like selfish because he's like doing his job? You know, or somebody who works in a supermarket who's the cashier, you know, are they selfish? They're they're doing their job. And if you are a writer, and whether you're earning money as a writer or not, if you're writing, you're a writer. And so that's your job. And so if you have to fit it in around, you know, actually earning a living, that's great. But I don't know if any of your viewers have had this experience, but like when I don't write, I don't feel good. I get mad. I feel testy. I'm like upset. You know, like I, I just feel like I'm not myself and I get very like angry and I start to hold on to things because I'm actually not honoring who I am and expressing myself in the way that I was meant to, you know? So instead of looking at setting aside time to write as being kind of a selfish thing, you know, it's a thing that's actually necessary to you as a human being to actualize and be who you are meant to be. And so it's important. It's as important as anything. And if you give yourself that time to honor who you are and that you love to write and that writing gives you joy and allows you to express yourself, everything else in your life will be better because of it. And so um, anyone who says you're selfish, I think you need to think about how that's about them and not about you and what you're doing. You know, um, why are they trying to stop you from doing the thing that you love? Excellent. Yeah. And lastly, again, what are some of the items as part of the ritual? So you said you have a cup of coffee or tea. You sit down at a certain time and you have these colored pencils. Come with colored pencils. I've got my little, um, like I'm a left brainer. So like everything is organized kind of like I, that's who I am as a person. So, um, 
yeah, I, I, I get my, my coffee is key. Back when I was in film school, I used to smoke cigarettes. And so I finally was like, oh my God, I gotta quit cigarettes. They're really bad. I was having a cough and everything. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna stop smoking. So I stopped smoking, I got the patch. I could not write because the smoking was so connected to my ability to be able to like think and be creative. I had created this connection that I had to actually sever that connection. It was really hard. But now coffee is my vice. So I have my cup of coffee, I have my mug. I sit down at my computer, I use pencils, I love pencils, they wear down, you can erase things, you can, um, they, they disappear, you know, like as you sort of sharpen them and keep writing, they disappear, which is kind of proof of, of all the stuff that's come out of my pencil, I can like see it, because now it's a nub, you know? Um, I have colored pencils to um, underline certain things, with certain characters in my outline so that I can track who, you know, how their arc is building in my outline. And it's just a way of me, a way of me organizing my writing time that, that it's so ritualized that I don't have to think about what's next. It's like that part of the practical part of writing is just like, I'm in the scene. I'm writing, I've got the coffee, which makes my brain feel like it's writing time, it's writing time. Here comes the caffeine, you know, and um, I don't know, just these rituals really help me. I do not listen to music when I'm writing. I, I cannot, because it's distracting to me. I can, I can listen to music if it doesn't have lyrics. If there are words, I just start listening to the lyrics, which is problematic for me. My husband's a screenwriter and he creates a soundtrack for whatever he's writing and he's got it blasting in his ears and like, he's like, bah, 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 bah. and I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> could you be quiet? My process is different than yours. Um, but, and he, you know, when he, when he writes dialogue, he's just, he's saying the words out loud. And the, so he has this very kind of like um, extroverted version of his process, but mine is really quiet and just kind of like focused with my coffee and um, my silence, you know? Um, and um, I get up every hour, I walk around, which helps me, you know, if I, if I sit for too long, I start to actually ruin the stuff that I wrote. So I find getting up and moving my body is really helpful. But yeah, I've just created these rituals that, you know, signal to my brain, it's time to work, you know, and that's been really helpful. You know, it's interesting about the cigarette and not, I mean, I wasn't a huge smoker, but yeah. there, and, and cancer is not sexy and emphysema is not sexy, <laughs> but there is a, there's a very sensual way that oh, yeah. one can think with a cigarette. Oh yeah. That's whether it's Parisian or whatever. I mean, oh, there's yeah. a way to exhale and yes. each one means different things. So I could see yeah. how that would be a difficult thing aside it from the nicotine. Well, and I didn't realize that I had been smoking so much when I was writing and working, but it had, that connection had been made and just the breathing in and the breathing out and the nicotine, which then I substituted with caffeine. I think there's definitely a stimulant effect that I, I like when I'm working. But boy, was I was I shocked when I realized like I can't think anymore without smoking. And I have to find something else to kind of substitute in for that. Yeah. And it's also too the way you ash some you know, there's just ash, little it's effects. In your fingers. Right. It's like it blows in your you're just like in this cocoon of fog, which I loved. You know, yeah, um, yeah, and all my clothes smelled like smoke. I thought, I think at that time, I thought it was very romantic. <laughs> it's probably disgusting, but yeah. Well, you know, there was a time and a place for some of that, oh, and yeah. it was also, you know, you could yeah. commiserate with other smokers. It was oh, a very yeah. social thing. Oh yeah. But I could see how with writing, and you know, also having a, an alcoholic beverage, like certain things yeah. would play into that writer persona. That's right. That, that's that right. would be hard to break, but. That, that's right. I could never write with alcohol. It's just, I'm such a lightweight. It just doesn't work for me. But things that are stimul stimulants like cigarettes and coffee have always been kind of like my, my bad friends. <laughs> <laughs> My friends that I know I shouldn't be hanging out with. Right, but right. That your mother I, warned you about. She did. But they were so but, much fun. <laughs> they were so much fun. <laughs> yeah. How do you help writers find the emotional spine of their story? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. So the emotional spine is the most important thing. It is the most important thing. And oftentimes it's 
one of the last things that becomes really clear because sometimes you have to write through a bunch of stuff to actually realize what the emotional spine is of your story. But one way that I work with writers on finding their the emotional spine of their story is um, by using the hero's journey. And the reason I actually like that story model is I think it's the deepest kind of psychological model and it really is about fear and facing whatever darkness we have in ourselves, um, you know, in pursuing what we want. And so what I do with writers when they're, you know, sometimes writers have a really great story, but I'm like, what do they want? What's the emotional growth? Like what's their flaw? What's their problem? We actually do kind of um, talk through this idea of the hero's journey. And often what's missing is um, like a fear, like some people write main characters that are like perfect. Like they're just good people and they always do the right thing. And it's like after a while, it's kind of like, wow, the secondary characters are really fun and interesting. And your main character is just kind of like dull, you know? And so how do you um, take some of that juice that you've given your secondary characters and really create a main character who's complicated and flawed, you know? And it's so good to have a character that has a flaw because then they make mistakes, which creates more conflict. And then they do things out of fear, which allows us to understand them more deeply, you know, and create structure, so, which creates structure for us. So, so what I do is we sort of talk through, okay, what is your character afraid of? Like, what is their emotional need? Let's say it's love and connection. And let's just say they're afraid of being rejected, just to, to pick them a, a really simple example, right? And so I encourage writers to think about why are they afraid of being rejected? Like, what happened to them? What happened to them? And to actually write that scene, even if it's not going to be in the movie, like, what is the scene where they were rejected in some really primal, deep way. Then they are grounded in that character's backstory and they don't have to do a flashback, but everything they write is gonna be infused with that thing that happened to them. And it's gonna infuse the way that they interact with the world and how their fear gets triggered, right? And so a great character Let's say, let's say um, they got rejected in their past and they're going along in their life and they want love, but they don't have it. And the call to adventure is, oh my God, that person, that's my person. But they refuse the call because they're too afraid of being rejected, right? Again, so we're getting internal conflict. And then, Maybe I can do it this time. Maybe I can actually put myself out there. So they talk to their friends or they get some guidance from somebody, you know, like in the meeting, the mentor section of the hero's journey. And they, they realize like, if I do, if I, if I do this, then maybe I'll, I'll, find, I'll be able to be with that person. And so they decide to go for it and they commit to like, I'm going to, I'm going to make that person love me you know, and they set off on their quest. And now we're in act two and they go for their goal. And there's people who are helping them like, yeah, yeah, he really is really into you. Let's do this, you know, and someone, people are trying to stop, stop her. her. I'm just going to say it's a she at this point, you know, like, mm, you're not his type. He likes this other girl, like putting that fear so that that fear is externalized through a character that can press on that character in the story. And but they really want that person so bad. And so they keep moving forward. And the middle of act two in the hero's journey is called approach to the inmost cave. And the way to think about your story in this section is that in the cave is the treasure, which is that person that she wants to, to fall in love with her, right? And she really wants that person really badly. But the cave is made up of her fear. Because she wants him, she's, she's going to go for him. But as she's going for him, she gets more and more vulnerable. And so her emotions get triggered and she's afraid. And maybe, you know, a lot of times in a romantic comedy or a romance story, you know, the midpoint in act two is a kiss or some kind of intimate connection. And that triggers let's just say for our character that we just made up right now, that triggers her fear like, oh my God, I'm... So she pushes away again to protect herself. And the other person's like, wait, what's going on? I thought we, and she's, you know, and then she, she does something even more sort of out of her fear. 
And now she's at the end of act two, she's completely alone. She's blown it and she's failed. And that person is with someone else. And she's never, ever going to have that person love her. Okay. But then maybe the mentor comes in or maybe she discovers something that allows her to believe she has a chance, one more chance. And so she decides, I'm going to, I'm going to try it again one more time. And that launches her into act three. And then there's that race, you know, or she's trying to get to the person, whatever. And in that scene, she has to face her fear, like, like, you know, the, the classic cliche version of this is like, she's running to the airport. Oh my God, he's leaving on a plane. She gets there and there goes the plane. He's gone, right? So that set, that death of her dream at the end of act two, where she failed is reenacted once more. And it's like, oh my God, she's not going to get what she wants. But then she turns and there he is. He didn't get on the plane or He goes on the plane and he leaves. And in a scene that happens after that, they meet again by accident or something. And she tells him how she feels and she opens herself up and she's completely vulnerable, which is her growth and her transformation. And because she's grown and because she's revealed her true feelings, he's like, hell yeah, I'll be with you. And she gets what she wants. So the hero's journey, by creating this idea of the fear in in the character and actually grounding it in a real thing, that's something you can play with in the story to create emotional growth for the main character. Um, And another way that I like to think about um, creating emotional structure for the for the character in the story is that, you know, how are they going to change? And um, this may be a Richard Walter thing again. I don't know if I'm pulling this from, from Richard. I probably am. But the, he, I think in his book, he talks about this idea of um, like a bow and arrow. And if you're, let's just say, you know at the end of this movie that you're writing that she's going to stand before him and say how much she loves him and be really vulnerable. So that's, the, that's where the arrow lands, right? So in creating the arc, the emotional arc, you want to pull that that arrow back as far away from that as you can so that there it looks like there's no way she can ever be vulnerable with anybody okay so that you're you're creating these this polarity in the story of how who she is at the beginning what her belief system is about herself and the world and then how it changes at the end and then you're kind of building the emotional journey between those two poles so that's another way to think about creating emotional structure you know, as you were speaking, I, it was taking me back to sixteen candles. Oh my gosh! So yes. I, was, I mean, I, I realize I'm going back a few years, yes. but I'm so I'm thinking of the Molly Ringwald character. Yes, and she's feeling left out because her sister's wedding, right? Yeah. Yes, and and everybody's busy. Yes, and then she has the crush on Jake. Jake, right? Yeah, we all remember Jake, we all remember and Jake. he's got like sort of the cheerleader girlfriend, and in her mind. He's totally unattainable, yeah. but he was perfect. Right. And so she's at the dance, yeah. and then she gets sort of this unwanted attention, but it's part mentor, right? The, right. The, the one character. And forgive me, is it Anthony Michael Hall? Yes. Or? Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. And, and he was awesome in the film, and, and yeah. he's kind of a mentor, but he's also trying to pick her up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so... Yeah. You know, and then yeah, we don't want to spoil it, even though the movie's thirty you plus can spoil years old. It. Okay, all right, all right, it's it's been a it's been a little, yeah. but it's, so then there's the moment where there he is, yes, and yes. it's the awkward, and I forget he's got his car, he probably has like this Porsche yeah. or whatever, yeah, yeah, and so and then they have the weird conversation, and yeah. and you know, yeah, but yeah. So I'm thinking of I'm thinking yeah. of that. That's exactly how. It yeah, the all is lost. Right. right at the end of Act Two, we have it where you know, the, the person is with someone else and then the character has to kind of relive it in the climax again, right? Um, and um, that character of Jake, it's so interesting because I, I watched that movie a few months ago. His character is so problematic. <laughs> oh, is he? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it's but it's fascinating to watch it from 2021 back and, and going, oh yeah, we thought that was okay or whatever. You know, a lot of the stuff that happens in that movie. But that's exactly what I'm talking about, that emotional structure of like, there he is, you know? And um, yeah, and sometimes the way that that emotional growth happens in the climax is also, you know, like the the hero is sort of 
in the climax. It looks like they're 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 not going to get what they want again. You know, that person's gone or whatever. But because of what they've learned on the journey, they do something emotionally they never could have done at the beginning of the movie. And because they do it in that moment, they actually get what they want. And they might not get it in the want in the way that they wanted or thought they would get it back then, but it's it could be in a new way that is actually even better than the way they thought they were gonna get it. How does a writer find the central thematic spark of their screenplay? The central thematic spark, oh yeah. That's like the magic. That's part of the magic that we were talking about, I think. Um, for me, and this is just my experience, is theme comes like almost last. Like I, it's not, it's not a spark in the sense of like a catalyst for an idea for me. It really is something that comes after. I've kind of worked a lot and, and basically thought, oh, that's the theme. And then no, that's not the theme. And then that's the theme. And that's not the theme. And suddenly the theme is the thing for me that comes last. It comes for me as a writer when I have figured out who the characters are, what they want deeply, what their fears are. And as I see them struggling to kind of get what they want, and again, it really happens for me toward the end of the writing process in revision. Because I may think I have a theme starting out and it's never, that never ends up what it's about. Because as I explore and excavate my characters, it, it, it appears. And it does feel like magic because for me it's about like, oh my God, this movie's really about this. I had no idea that it was about this. And I work with a lot of writers too who think they know what their theme is. And um, it turns out that what they're writing is not what they started out thinking their movie was about. And it's evolved into something else. And so that those little things that they thought were really important at the beginning of the writing process end up falling away in favor of whatever is now sort of taking hold because of the character development in, in the story. Um, so for me, it's really, it, it's part of the magic and I don't, I don't really even know what my movie's about when I, when I start anymore. I just, I trust that I will know and I don't, I don't know. I have, I have found when I was first starting out writing that when I started with a theme, like this is a movie about blank, that it kind of became wooden you know, because I was basically just writing to fulfill some prescriptive kind of tenet or something. I don't know. But when I just trust that I don't need to know my theme, I'll wait for it. It will come to me. Usually it does. Um, sometimes it doesn't. And I have to have other people read it to tell me, what do you think this is about? Because I just kind of get lost in the weeds. Um, yeah. Arthur Miller, I love this, the way he, that we, the way he worked with theme. Um, he had this little building outside of his house that was like his writing shed. I'm sure it was really beautiful. <laughs> so calling it a shed is probably wrong. But he would go out there and he obviously was working on a typewriter, right? Because it was the 50s or whatever. And he would, he would start writing his plays. And he said that in the writing process, he would suddenly realize what the theme was. And it was usually when he was kind of in the middle of writing his play. And then he would type up the theme and put it above the typewriter. And that guided the rest of his writing. So he would find his theme in the middle of the process of writing his plays. Um, and I'm sure there are some people who have a theme at the beginning and are able to kind of write to that. But it, it, to me, it's kind of like, it's magical. Like it's, it's, you need to like leave it. You need to let it come to you. Um, because I think it's not, even though a theme feels intellectual, like this movie is about this. I think theme, theme is actually really like from the heart. It's a heart thing, not like a brain thing. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So it sounds like, okay, because so much of writing seems like there's these rules and you're connecting the dots oh to so much. But with this, and I'm sure this is hard for writers to do, you're letting it go and you don't know. That's right. That sounds like it's very troublesome for it's writers. It's so <laughs> troublesome. I mean, and, and, and obviously I'm not, I'm not saying like go crazy, just write everything because it's a balance. Like as a human being, you have a left brain, you have a right brain. Organizer holistic, intuitive. You need both of them to write a great script, okay? And so, you know, part of it is magical, but 
but part of it is actually figuring out, like creating a map for yourself so that you don't go out into the weeds. Now, I know people, I know a lot of people who don't have outlines. That's great. Like if you can do that, if you can figure it out and really let yourself be completely free, which to me is terrifying, I cannot be completely free because I will just shut down. It's too scary. So I make a roadmap for myself. Um, but then if I'm in there and it's like, oh, this isn't working the way I thought it would, and this is boring, like where should this, where should this be going? You know, and try to follow those things. So it's a balance of of structure and also allowing for creative discovery in the writing process. You know. So set your your sort of time, your date with yourself to sit down, whether it's longhand or at the typewriter. Yeah. Have your little rituals, your offerings. Have your offerings. And then Make start writing. Yeah, yeah. And then hopefully the thunder outside the window <laughs> brings what the theme is about. Or like you said, you, you had other people look at your work and say what yeah. they thought the theme was. Yeah. I mean, when I get really stuck and basically people come to me when they're stuck right? Like they've looked at their script and they have taken it as far as they can. And they just need someone from the outside to look at it. We all do, you know? And so I have people who look at my stuff. I have a, a, a friend, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a girls group and um, it's writers, it's producers, um, it's teachers, it's storytellers. And, you know, we're friends, it's a social group, but we also share um, our materials with each other if we need feedback. And it has been so helpful. I just um, I just wrote a book and I just felt like, I, do, I don't know what to do with this anymore. And I gave it to them and they were brutal and they're extremely smart. And I was just like, oh my God, this is gold. And I was able to go back in there, see what I couldn't see, right? Because they're coming. And so I think we all as writers need those people, like who's our little circle of, um, who's our community of, of fellow writers that we can go to and I'll read your stuff and you read my stuff. Because yes, writing is a lonely sport, but you can't always be alone. You actually do need people, you know? And that's the great thing about working on a TV show because you're in a room with lots of people. Now, there are issues that come out of that, right? Like personalities and all that stuff. And I'm sure you've talked to people who are TV writers who have, stories to tell about writing rooms. But like the great thing about it is you're in a room with other people. And you know, I've worked as a story consultant at Pixar and one of the things I absolutely loved is that like I'm in a room with other people and we're working together on this story, which is not normally the way feature writers work, which is I'm a feature writer. So it's it, it was it was so fun to me to for, for me to be in a room with other people. Um, and so you know I want to advise people like Find your group, like who are your people? Who can you share this experience with and give encouragement to and notes to and all that kind of stuff because you can only take your project so far alone. You, you need other people, yeah. And, and so with the talented Mr. Ripley, what is yeah. the theme? Oh, gosh. The talented Mr. Ripley is based on a book by Patricia Highsmith. And Patricia Highsmith is one of my favorite writers. She's extremely dark, and it's all about twisted human psychology. Um, and she wrote *The Price of Salt*, which be, which um, actually Phyllis Nagy turned into the amazing movie *Carol*. Right. So she wrote about not just super dark things, but but other other things as well. But um, the talented Mr. Ripley. Honestly, I don't know what the theme is. It, 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 it doesn't, I think the thing I love about the movie and the book is that it won't fit into our prescribed little boxes of theme, you know, or meaning because the main character is this guy who's doing everything a main character should never do. And yet we're riveted by him. And so we're able to kind of see the humanity in the darkness, in the dark psychology. And so I think what I'm attracted to in her is that. And for me, that's the theme. It's like, wow, monsters are human too. And they are just like me in some ways. So that's why I love her stuff. Um, and her writing, you know, it's it's so unique and so specific that you 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 can try to kind of like box her in to like what we understand as like, 
this kind of movie or this kind of book or this kind of theme, but like she will not be boxed, <laughs> which is and, what makes her great. But she faced a lot of criticism, especially at that time. Right? Absolutely. And, you know, her politics were terrible. I mean, she really was, was in many ways not a great human being. But as a writer, like, I have to admire how she just did what everyone said, don't do it. Don't do it. And yet, and, and in doing that, created these really compelling characters that we should, by all rights, not like and not feel empathy toward. And I think she pulls it off. I'm not talking about Carol. I'm talking about Ripley, which is a completely different char character. Sure. Um, but yeah, she just breaks the rules, which I love. Yeah. Why do you teach your students three different types of story structure? So you have the hero's journey, the three-act structure, and then something that was new to me, which is the Jules Selbo's 11-step model? Yeah. So... You know, there are all these different story structure models out there in the world, and, you know, they just have different terms, but they're all basically kind of the same approach to story structure. Um, so, and every writer has a different process and a way of thinking about story. So I think it's really good to expose yourself as a writer to all the different models and see, okay, which one helps me? You know, and I think the important thing to remember is it's their forms, not formulas. It's not something you should follow like paint by number, like here's page 30, this is where the turning point, mid six, midpoint is on page 60, you know, like, like I really use these um, story models as inspiration rather than, you know, some sort of set of rules that I have to follow. Um, and so I like to give my writers different tools to put in their toolbox and then to use the ones that are helpful to them. And there are, um, there are three that I really like, and there's others too that are really amazing, but I just find it, you know, I don't want to give people too many things, which just makes them crazy and confused, including myself, by the way. So um, I like the hero's journey, which we've already talked about. Um, and I use that, which is, you know, the ordinary world, the call to adventure, the refusal to the call out of fear, meeting the mentors, crossing the threshold, blah, blah, blah. Um, so so for those those people that are really interested in psychological storytelling and emotional journeys, I think that's that's the number one one. And you know that story model is fascinating because um, Joseph Campbell, who actually identified that pattern of storytelling, you know he studied myths and fairy tales across all different kinds of cultures and across all recorded history, and it's the same pattern. So it it. And he sort of likens characters in these myths and fairy tales to those that Carl Jung found in our unconscious brain. And it's like, I think the reason this story model is so powerful is it comes from our human brain. Our need to have a story told in a certain way where we're processing our own fears and our own struggles, you know. Um, so I, I love that story model. Um, it helps me a lot. Again, not a formula, it's a form. You can move those and shift those phases around, you know, or draw, or not have a phase. You know, it's up to you to use it creatively. Um, and you can see that pattern in Hollywood movies. You can also see it in um, um, more independent, character-driven, slightly experimental films. You can find traces of it. So it just depends how much you wanna embrace that in your, in your structure. Um, and then I also talk a little bit about three-act structure, which is kind of the way everybody talks about story structure. You know, um, ordinary world, inciting incident, act one turning point, you know, um, midpoint, end of act two where the everything falls apart. And then I'm going to try one more time and then climax and then resolution. Um, and that's just a really simple way to think of feature writing, which is mostly what I focus on with writers. Um, so there's that model. Um, and then there's the Jewel Selbo model. And I'm going to get my cheat my cheat Oh, please do. Here. Yeah, yeah. This um, was new to me. <laughs> but I, Jewel Selbo wrote a book. I can't remember the name of it, but it's um, it's J-U-L-E-S-E-L-B-O. S-E-L-B-O. And she is wonderful. And this, this way of telling feature um, stories is so simple and so clear. And I just find it really helpful. So I'll share that with you. Um, and again, you know, if, if you find that this is like working for you and you really um, 
are attracted to it, like get her book because it explains it in much more detail. Um, but she basically says there are 11 steps in a feature film. The first step is the character's overall want and why. So you establish through action what they want and why they want it. And then the character logically goes for it. So they take action to try to get that thing that they want. But the character is somehow denied. Okay, they, they, that's not gonna work. They can't, they can't get it that way. Um, but the character gets a second opportunity to um, achieve their overall want. But there's danger around that second opportunity. Like it's kind of a shady way. Maybe it's not on the up and up, but there's some danger around it, either emotionally or physically, okay? But they want it so badly at the end of act one they go for it. They decide to go for it. Again, you'll these these forms are the same. Like they they're just different language around the same turning points and stuff. But at the end of of Act One, the character decides to go for it. And now we're in Act Two, right? And so um, all goes well. They're going for it. Look, look, they're getting what they want. Oh my God! But something happens in the middle of the script. And one thing I would love to share with your um, viewers is this idea of the midpoint. You know, um, sometimes the midpoint, people think of it as like something happens out of the blue that that causes everything to fall apart or it's like a false victory and then they have to deal with it's false or whatever. But I always think the best midpoints are a moment where the character just like everything's going okay, they're getting what they want, but then they get to that cave and it's like they're in that cave and their fear is around them and they make a decision out of fear that causes everything to fall apart for them. They go back to their old pattern and that actively gives them, like they drive that midpoint and, and causes everything to fall apart, which in Jules' um, um, 11 step structure is called all falls apart, <laughs> right? So all falls apart, looks like they're gonna fail. Um, and then at the end of act two, there's a crisis where they, again, they have to make a decision or a commitment. Um, do they go for a new strategy? Do they give up? You know, what do they do? Usually they decide to try again. And that decision or that crisis decision drives them into act three. Um, and then we have this climax where it's the final attempt to get what they want. And again, usually we have a transformation, right? They do something they never could have done back in act one. They get what they want. And then the last phase she calls truth, the truth comes out to make things right. And this is where, um, that the character discovers something new about her world. She has some new insight about herself um, and that usually has the power to heal whatever was broken back at the beginning of the story. Um, and so what I love about this, this story model is that it's really goal-driven. You know, it's like they want something, they decide to go for it, they get blocked, they get a second opportunity, I'm afraid, I want it so much I'm gonna go for it. It's just it allows you to really find that goal for your character and let them pursue that in the story. That's awesome. And who yeah. was Jewel Selbo? Jewel Selbo is an incredible writer. I can't say enough great things about her. She's a friend. She's a wonderful woman. She's a super talented writer. Um, I met her as just a, a colleague, uh, as a writer and a person who worked with screenwriting students. Um, she's written a bunch of different movies. She did a lot of animation. She's um, writing novels now. Um, she just wrote a new kind of like detective novel that just came out. Um, and she's phenomenal. And I think she's still teaching. But um, she really just looked at all this material out there and she said, I'm gonna make up my own version of this that's really simple. It's really character and goal driven. Um, and I've used that 11 step story structure a lot in my own work and with clients. Now you have a film that you wrote and directed that starred Alicia Silverstone. Yes. And it's a true crime? It's called True Crime. Okay. Yes. Please don't watch it. It's not very good. Oh, no. <laughs> no. Oh, no. I would love to tell my true crime story if um, people do. are interested. Mm -hmm. If any if any of your viewers are interested in being filmmakers, um, in addition to being writers, you know, like wanting to make your own films, um, because I actually started out and I wanted to be a director. And I went to UCLA Film School. I was in the directing program there. I got my MFA there. And I was um, positive that that's what I wanted to do until I directed a movie called True Crime. <laughs> and I just found um, it, was, it was a great experience. Like I learned so much, but I also realized 
I'm not a director. Like I don't enjoy being kind of the focus of everybody's questions and lots of stress and all that stuff. I really realized like, oh my gosh, I had such a great time writing the script. Like I'm the right, I'm the writer. I'm not the director. Um, but it was it was a great experience. And what it taught me as a writer is because because I was directing it too, and it was pretty low budget. You know, at the time we had like 18 days to shoot it, so it was kind of crazy. Um, what I what I found is, and I wish I had known this before I actually directed it, is how important it is if you're actually making your own scripts, like you're and you're kind of doing it DIY. I mean, I had a studio that it, I think the budget was 1.2 million dollars, which at the time was it was a decent low budget movie. Um, but what I wish I had known, and I wish I had listened to people who told me, is you know, make it contained. Don't have a lot of different locations. Really boil your script down to only the scenes that you absolutely need to tell your story. Because what ended up happening is that we would have company moves, and I just, I every day I lost scenes where the producers were just like, we can't shoot that scene because we don't have enough time. And so it was just very frustrating to, to watch my story. You know, eventually it kind of makes sense. You know, in the editing room, we had to kind of rewrite the movie to, to fix all the things that we couldn't shoot. Um, but, and it kind of worked out. But um, what was great about it is I learned I didn't want to be a director. I really learned that I am a writer through and through. I like being alone. Yes, I like being with other people in a room too, but I do not like being on a set and being in charge of a bunch of people. It was just extremely uncomfortable for me. <laughs> sure. I mean, sometimes the idea of something sounds wonderful and the title of it. And then once you actually get into doing it, then oh, you realize yeah. that, okay, this isn't for me. This but This isn't for me. I'm going to yeah, get through sense. this. You know, and I had done it in film school. I had directed several films, which I love doing, but it was on a much smaller scale. It was just my friends and I making a movie and it was great. But when it became this big thing, I just realized, you know, I don't have the temperament to really um, deal with all this stress, you know? Sure. Sure. Now, yeah. um, what prompted you to write the story? The um, that Pop? story. Oh, mm -hmm. that was that, that. This is actually might be really interesting um, for your viewers. Um, I got out of film school, and I, you know, I said I was in the directing program, so I had a couple short films that I had made. But my agent said, "You need to write something. You need to write a feature." And I was like, "Okay, um, what should I write about? I have no idea." And I remembered back to something that happened to me when I was a little girl. Um, when I was like nine or 10 years old, I was at my grandparents' house and I was, I don't know, I was looking for something and I went into my grandfather's closet and I found this stack of true detective magazines, which back in the day were like, you know, the way we have true crime now, it's all over television. Well, back in the day, it was kind of this secret thing and there were these magazines, right? And um, I was like, oh, what are these magazines? You know, I'm like a 10 year old. Oh, and I opened them up and it's like literally photos of like dead bodies with like black strips over their eyes. And I was just like, ah, what is this? And then I was reading and they described like how the person got murdered and how the detectives, you know, went after them and figured out who had committed the crime and everything. And part of me was like this whole ugly world of like the real world was opened up to me. But I also was like, this is cool. Like detective stuff. Like I like this, you know, but my grandfather was like, Patty. And I was like, oh put it in a way, pretend like I never saw it. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm innocent. Um, but I also, you know, it, it really ignited in me this interest in true crime, which I still have. Um, but as I was thinking of, you know, what do I want to write? I was like, oh, maybe I could write about like that thing of finding those magazines. So I ended up fictionalizing it. And I just made it about a high school girl who's obsessed with true crime magazines. And um, a girl at her high school gets murdered and she decides she's gonna find out who the killer was. So it's kind of like a Nancy Drew kind of, right. you know, beast, B-level movie about this girl who wants to find the killer. And it's kind of a coming of age story really. Um, but it came from my own experience, you know, and, and a lot of the stuff that I write, it, it, it may not be technically, literally what happened to me, but there's always something in there that did happen to me. You know, and so I think when you're looking for a story, you always want to have that personal connection somehow, because that's kind of where the juice is for you as a writer. You know, especially if you're scared to write it, that's a good thing. Well, the million dollar question is, what yeah. was the theme of Ooh, True Crime? Oh, the theme. I think the theme ended up being, be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for. Interesting. You know, 
Um, you think you know the way the world works, little girl, you have no idea, you mm. know? So it's kind of dark. It was kind of a dark theme. Sure. sure. Yeah. When you were writing a story, what type of structure do you use most often? Hero's journey. That's, that's, I use that structure probably the most because, um, again, it helps me kind of track the emotions of my character. What are they afraid of? What do they want? Um, how do they have to kind of face that fear? Um, I'm writing something now and I decided to do something I should probably not have done, which is like, I'm going to go free. I'm going to, I'm going to try to just start writing this thing. And I just, I, bleh, I just barfed it out, which is, which is actually good for me. Cause I need to actually do that. Cause I'm, I tend to be over here in my left brain a lot. And so I, I barfed this thing out and it's like, it's like 70 pages. I'm not even really sure what it is, except it is a detective themed thing. Um, but I read through it again and now I'm going, oh, okay. I think this is what it is. Like this one little part over here, that's where like the, the juice lies. Um, and so now I'm taking that little juicy thing and going, okay, how can I sort of um, approach the rewrite with more of a, of a map and a view to kind of now what I think it's about? Um, and so usually I just, I, I make a very loose outline. Um, it's not detailed. It really just says kind of like the major action beats, you know, like what happens in the inciting incident or the call to adventure and whether the person pushes away from it out of fear and then what happens next to kind of pull them in. Um, but I want to leave it kind of not, not detailed because then that leaves things for me to discover when I'm writing. So is it harder for you to not be organized and, and invested in structure? Yes, it's very hard for me to be free. That's why I think I gave myself that challenge of just, Pat, let step away from the outline. <laughs> step away <laughs> from the, the outline. outline down. <laughs> and I needed to kind of just go bleh. You know, and um, when I did that, I actually found really interesting things happening that I didn't expect. And again, that's where I found that little spark that was like, oh, this is this is what it's about. Um, so, yeah, for me and I think writers should challenge themselves like what's hard for you? Make yourself do that thing. Make yourself do it, even if you're scared of doing it, you know, make yourself do it and then um, get more comfortable with it because there's something in there. That's scaring you, and that's good. You need to go there. You need to go into your own approach to the cave as a writer, you know. Um, so I work with a lot of people who are writing kind of um, memoir book books. And I work with authors as well, and a lot of the times they're like, "I think I'm going to change this so that it's not about the person, so that they when they read." And I'm like, "You know what? This is your draft. No one's going to read it but you. Write." every single thing that happened write the truth because if you're holding back we're gonna know that you're being untruthful with us now after you get out this version where everything the truth is everything everybody did is on the page then you can go back and modulate and figure out but you have to tell the truth you know and um, if you're writing a script that is based on experience and you find yourself going I don't want to write that scene you got to you got to go there you know that's the scene that's what your movie's about and you're afraid to go there cuz like there's something in there that you just don't want to look at or you know yeah and so for a a right brained writer mm -hmm. Uh, who's messy and chaotic yeah. and everything's sort of based yeah. on intuition then what would scare them is probably structure rules numbered sequence you know right and and i've worked with a lot of right brained writers, you know, and it's always, it's just a matter of, usually they don't, they, it's not like they do a 180 and suddenly become like, I'm have detailed outlines. Usually it's just getting them to a place that is comfortable for them to organize something so that they don't get lost in the weeds. You know, their right brain is their strength. It's like their superpower but it can also lead them into the darkness and down tangents and out into the woods and then they don't know how to get back and oh my God, where's the flashlight? So, you know, helping them find something that's comfortable in terms of organization, but not too detailed, you know? Um, and sometimes it's even just a matter of talking through the characters 
emotional journey and how they change that gives them enough in their head to kind of guide their writing as they're writing. So maybe they don't even write an outline. They just kind of talk it through so that they kind of know where they're going, you know? Wouldn't know anything about it. Yeah. Is that your... <laughs> I, I'm a right brain. Okay. Yeah. I'm um, like, yeah. Tried and true. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Check out the hero's journey. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I love um, the interview that uh, Bill Moyers did with um, oh, Joseph, Joseph Campbell. Campbell. Yes. It's so excellent. And, yes. and he just... Um, the, the two yeah. of them together were, were just a great team. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in, yeah. in terms of uh, the interview. Yeah, that's a great that's a great piece of I'm so glad they recorded it. Right. For posterity. Wouldn't you say that if writers and filmmakers follow these structures that their films will be predictable? You know, that's often something we yes. get in our comments. Yes. And well, this is why Hollywood produces, you know, these formulaic movies. Yes. Yes. That's always the danger. That's always the danger. And you know when you're watching a formulaic movie you know when you know exactly what's going to happen in the climax on 10 minutes in. You know that that movie is going to fulfill those expectations, right? So there's a couple of ways to approach that idea of cliche and predictability. Um, if you're writing, you know, the predictability doesn't just lie along structure lines. It also lies along genre lines that certain genres hold have conventions that become familiar patterns, right? And so um, the trick is to look at these forms, whether it's a structural form like the hero's journey or three-act structure as a form and not a formula, that it's just there to give you some landmarks to help work through you know, the story with your character. Um, and then if you're writing in a specific genre, you know, if I'm writing a horror movie and it doesn't have scary stuff in it, like that's going to be a failure. So I have to understand the genre I'm working in and what the expectations of my audience are. And I have to deliver that in a way that feels fresh. The audience is coming to your movie with expectations of the conventions of that genre. They're going to want to see in the romantic comedy, the, the mistaken identity or the misheard thing or the kiss at the end or whatever. So how do you deliver those things without making them feel like boring and cliched and well, well trod, right? So that's your challenge as a writer to, um, to either embrace the conventions and make them feel fresh or kind of subvert them. Um, I just watched a movie last week. It's not a great movie, but it's, it's good. And it's, it's very like lovely. Um, the Mitchells versus the Machines on Netflix. It's an animated movie. Um, and one thing they did at the ending, which I thought was really funny, is, you know, in the hero's journey, the way that they kind of combated this idea of like, and now this is going to happen, and now this is going to happen. What happens is, you know, in the hero's journey, in the climax, when you're facing off against the bad guy, it looks like you're going to die. Oh, no, they died, but then they live. So what they did in the movie... Um, is um, they face the robots, you know, and the family's fighting and they they beat the robots and it's like they destroy the bad guy and it's like, yay! But then the main character has fallen into this pit and the family gathers around. It's like, oh my God, Katie, no! And it looks like she's dead. And she just pops up and she goes, just kidding. They're mocking that story moment in the hero's oh. journey. And so they're acknowledging it and they're making fun of it and we laugh. And so there's ways of embracing things at the same time that you're kind of like going, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I know that that is that moment. I'm going to have fun with it. Um, so I think, um, I, think you have to, um, I think you have to kind of find your way toward um, originality, you know. Um, and, you know, some people say, you know, there's, there's movies that don't, you know, embody some sort of three-act structure, which is absolutely true. You know, there are films that are mini-plot or anti-plot. But the thing that people have to understand is that mini-plot and anti-plot are a response to arch-plot, which is three-act structure. They are responses to the classical form, okay? So they take elements of three-act structure and twist them and use them in different ways. So like in a, in a mini plot movie, you might get all the information, you might get all this information except what you're used to getting 
in a normal movie. So they're messing with your expectations of information that you get about the character. Or the main character in the mini plot play or the anti plot play or movie may not change, right? But the audience has a shift, has a transformation. So they're taking these elements and turning them around, you know, and using them in different ways. But in order to do that successfully, you have to actually understand arch plot. So for those of you who are interested in like doing really cool, weird things with structure, like just learn what classical structure is and then, you know, think about how you're subverting it or playing with it or commenting on it because that's where really interesting stuff starts to happen structurally in dramatic storytelling. Can you think of a movie that, that does that? that yeah, well, Tarantino does that all the time. You know, like he plays around with these conventions of, you know, ways that we're normally used to seeing movies and he just messes with them. He makes chapters, he flips time zones, people are commenting, we circle back, where are we? So he has a lot of fun with, with structure because he understands what he's playing with. You know, um, if people are interested in um, Jim Jarmusch also creates movies that are um, um, not the normal structure that we're used to, um, you know, um, but these are people who are really doing like really cool experimental stuff, but they also understand movies, all kinds of movies. And that's why they're so successful breaking the rules and subverting, you know, the conventions. So yeah, so that, that old adage, before you can break the rules, you have to know the rules. That's kind of right. Thing. That's right. I, I believe that. Why is it important for writers to start their story slowly and take their time with introducing the characters? Mm. That's such a great, that's such a great question because um, we need that time to be introduced to your characters to create that empathy that we talked about. Like that's where you have the luxury of having a little bit of time up front to establish who they are, what they want, why they want it, and to allow us to kind of be introduced to their world um, and really get connected to them so that we're willing to follow them on the journey. And, you know, um, that takes pages. You know, I'm not saying you should spend like, you know, 20 pages introducing your main character. You shouldn't if you're writing a feature, for sure. You know, you, you pretty much do need to kind of get to that inciting incident or that call to adventure pretty quickly. But we need, but look at Wally, you know, like that little character, we just like follow him around in his little world, doing his little thing. And we learn so much about him and we basically fall in love with him. And we will follow that little robot dude anywhere, right? And so, but we also get introduced to the world and the stakes in the world and that there's nothing really living in the world, you know? And so um, I think that's just a really beautiful example of visually um, starting slow and letting us connect to our character and his world. And in The Queen's Gambit, I know we we took some time. Yes. And, and the backstory wasn't always clear why she was in the orphanage. Right. And different things are revealed later and it yes. really keeps you... But why is she reacting this way? Oh, yes. and then finally you see yes. the conversation. That took, I, you know, I don't want to give away too much, but yeah. yeah, just little snippets and it takes time. Yeah, it takes time. And it also, you know, as the writer, when you're writing, you're starting to write, whether it's your pilot or your feature, it's like, you know, your job is to create questions, not give answers. Your, your job is to create questions like, why is she, like you said, why is she doing that? What's going on here? So that the audience is like, we're just moving closer and closer because we want to know. Why is she acting that way? Will she be able to be like a chess champion? Will she beat that, that guy or whatever? You know, it's like all these questions that you set up in the story is really what holds us to the story. And so, you know, in setting up your character, you don't want to just tell us a bunch of stuff about the character. You know, maybe we see them do something and we go, that's weird. Why are they doing that? And we keep wondering that until later we get the answer to that question as, as we start to fully understand kind of what, who this person is and why they are the way they are, you know? Um, so yeah, 
you're kind of like putting up, you're creating trails, you know, breadcrumbs, and you're leaving blank spots. Um, and one thing, one thing to think about too as a writer, which I think is really important, is to create ellipses in your story where there's gaps, where maybe we, you know, if you have a section of your script and it just feels like, da dun da dun da dun da dun here we go, every, you know, then she drives here, then she gets out, then, do, you know, it's like, do a time cut. Like, what's the next scene that moves the story forward? Like, let us, the audience, actively engage with the narrative to figure it out. Because the more we're doing that, the more interested we are in your story. So, you know, leave gaps, ask questions. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, take that time at the beginning, for sure. Why is it important for the main character to have a transformation? Oh, the main character, okay, so let's be honest. Most main characters do have transformations in most Hollywood movies, right? There's some growth. Um, there are main characters who don't transform. Forrest Gump, does he change? No, he just like, he just stays the same through the whole movie. The early James Bond movies, James Bond doesn't really change. He's just getting the chicks and, you know, bringing down the bad guy, right? So the thing to remember is it's not necessarily that your main character has to transform. It's that you need transformation in your story because that is actually what's important. So, um, so if you have a main character who doesn't change and they kind of move through the story like this, what happens is they change everyone around them. Like Forrest Gump changes everyone around him, but he's just still Forrest Gump, right? You know, James Bond, it's been interesting to watch him sort of evolve, you know, with the Daniel Craig version because 9-11, like suddenly James Bond became like this wounded hero where he was always just the suave martini girls, you know, blasting off into space, Roger Moore. He was the one that I grew up with, Roger Moore. Um, but it's been interesting to watch his character evolve, you know, and become more of a character that has a tiny bit more of an emotional range, you know, in the, in the stories. Um, but yeah, it, it, you know, transformation in a story is a key element and whether it comes through your main character or your main character changing, um, everyone else, it doesn't matter. It's just that transformation is actually the purpose of a story. It's actually the purpose of a story because the reason we tell stories is to actually understand ourselves better. And that insight is a transformation for us. Okay. So however you package your transformation in your story, have at it, you know, it's up to you. Um, but the reason we watch stories is to be transformed. So if someone were looking to write a Forrest Gump type scenario, maybe leave it for a few scripts down the line because that, that was very specific how all that was done and there's many timelines. Yeah, that was a very complex script for sure. Um, yeah, it's easier to write a story where the main character changes, right? Because it's just clearer or whatever. But if you really have a character who doesn't change, who kind of takes us through the story, but really the point of the movie is how this person changes the world around him or her or them, then, you know, for sure, write that story. It's just, it's just ha think about how, why is that person, um, why is that person the catalyst to change all these other people, you know, and how can they change the world around them? You know? Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah, I'm not sure with Queen's Gambit. Did she, I, I would say she, she she had a shift. She did. Okay. I mean, not there a times. huge one. Right. Right. It's like, did she really change? You know, but I felt like she did because I felt like um, I don't know. I'm not an expert on the Queen's Gambit, um, but I I like I love what Scott Frank did because um, she's she's impenetrable in a way. Like she really is impenetrable, you know, um, and the actress is, is sort of has that face that's impenetrable, you know? Um, and at the same time, I felt like I got close to her. I got close to her. Like the mask was pierced by the end of the, of this, of the show, you know, um, even though she didn't have this huge, you know, transformation, like a lot of main characters do. Um, but I think she, I think she did. She did, she did grow and we pierced her mask.
We did, but she did feel like an engine driving sort of because even the right. camera movement, it would yeah. follow her up. You, yes. you, you saw she was driving the shot. Yes, she brings us into the world and the scenes. Um, and she is very sort of like mask-like, you know, mm -hmm. and she doesn't give a lot of emotion and the character isn't written that way. And um, But I, I did feel that I was taken on a transformative journey for sure. You know, and that's that's a that's a tri that's a tribute to Scott Frank's abilities as a writer to be able to coordinate this character, who um, seems at once kind of like opaque, and yet at the same time creates this feeling of transformation. By the end of that show, we're just like, oh, I've had this journey. She has taken me on this journey, you know, with her, um, which was really great. How much easier is it for the writer if they know? from the beginning, what the character wants. A million times easier. It's a million times easier if you kind of know what the character wants. But there's always a starting point. You think you know what they want at the beginning and you start writing with that and then it can shift, you know? And so um, I think it's the most important thing. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, when I do consultations with people, it's the singular most popular problem in the script is what do they want? How are they trying to get it? You know, what are they doing to try to get it? How does that make them face something in themselves and how do they grow? And do they finally get this thing or do they get it in a way that they didn't expect? So um, I think I think I always try to start out like what do they want because I've learned over the years like I need to know what that is because that's the engine that drives their actions through the story. And when I don't know that and I start to write, I'm just kind of like just driving over here, I'm driving over here, I don't know, you know, it just it ends up being I throw out a lot of pages. So I think you can start like what is their emotional need? You know, do they want love? Do they want revenge? What is it that's driving them? And then what's the specific thing they think is gonna get, is gonna satisfy that need and how do they pursue that? And um, you may start with that and you may shift it. You know, as you start to write, you realize, oh, that's not what they want at all. They want this other thing. So then you're gonna have to go back and kind of, you know, reverse engineer what you did. But it's okay, that's the process, you know? And a lot of times characters' um, goals shift in the movie. You know, like in Get Out, which is a great movie, you know, Chris, he wants to go impress her family. In the middle of the in the middle of the movie, his goal shifts to like, I need to get out of here. They're gonna hijack my body and my brain, right? So, so that that shifts in in the story, but but that's good. That's okay. But he still has a goal throughout that drives him. And you've said before that sometimes when you sit down to write, that your character sometimes starts to tell you what they want, in a sense. Yeah. I just had an experience with this barf thing that I did, this thing that I just vomited out. Like, I'm just going to write, write, write. And I was just like, I was, I kind of had the plot in my head because, again, this side, the left side is so dominant in my brain. And I was just like, okay, this is when this happens. And then suddenly she's in the middle of the scene and, like, there's a flashback where somebody's, she's curled up in a ball in the bathroom and someone's throwing movie magazines at her from the 1940s. And I was like, <laughs> then I went back into the scene. I'm like, well, that just happened. I I don't know what happened to her, but something happened to her. And then I kept writing. And then again, when I went back, that was where all that whole backstory is what the whole thing is really about. Why she's doing what she's doing, what she's going to have to face, you know, in the story. Um, but that was never in my brain that that would ever happen. I would, that there were, that flashback was just going to pop up in the middle of, of my writing. Um but it was great. It, they, she started talking to me. She started telling me stuff that happened to her. <laughs> and I was like, okay. What if we can't figure out what the character wants? Oh, wow. Yeah. What if you can't figure out what the character wants? Um, again, a very common issue, right? Um, some strategies that you might do to try to figure out what the character wants um, is to figure out um, what they're afraid of. What are they afraid of? Like, what are they scared of? And what do they want that's in contrast to that? You know, does the, could their want come from wanting the opposite of that fear? Do you know what I mean? If they're afraid, let's say they were um, had a traumatic past or a traumatic childhood, you know, um, 
could they really want just the perfect family? You know, could you start from fear and generate a want as the opposite of that? Um, that's one way to kind of try to generate some ideas about, you know, what your character could want. Um, one thing that I often do with my clients and my students is um, I have them write a monologue. Um, and monologues in movies are, we're not supposed to write monologues. It's one of the rules. But you know what? This exercise is actually really helpful. And what I ask them to do is to sit down and imagine their character is in a room with someone else in the movie that they trust, another character that they trust. And that other character says, what do you want? And this character tells that other character what they want. And I, I ask the writers to use all their five senses to describe this dream that they have and just to allow that character to talk to the writer and describe what they want with no preconceptions. And usually out of, and I say write for five minutes and don't stop. So just stream of consciousness, I want this. And you know, somewhere in there is, the, is a kernel of something that they can actually grab onto and hold onto. So again, giving an invitation to your character to speak to you about what they want. So if they don't know what the character wants, it doesn't necessarily mean they need to abandon it, that that no. character is not really connecting with them. No. Okay. No, it's just that they don't know yet. They have to listen. They aren't listening. They're trying to like put things on the character. You know, if you step into the character and let them talk, they will tell you things, you know? So let them tell someone else in the movie what they want. What are the ways a writer can create stakes for their character? Oh, great question. So obviously stakes are really important um, for characters because they create suspense and tension around um, the goal, right? So if they don't achieve what they want to achieve, something terrible will happen. They will lose something. Um, there, Linda Seeger wrote this really great book called How to Make a Good Script Great. It's not just for rewriting. You can use it to write a first draft. But she actually has a really great chapter on stakes. And what she came up with is a list of what is a list of stakes for any human being. And I, I'm going to try to remember off the top of my head, but it's like survival, love and belonging, security, security, um, uh, the aesthetic, which is a sense of order or control, um, self-actualization, which is um, self-expression. So the loss of any one of these things on this list is devastating for a human, right? Survival, physical survival. Oh my God, I'm dead, right? Love and belonging. If we don't have love and belonging, we're basically dead. Safety and security, we also need that. If we don't have it, it's going to be bad, right? So all of these stakes, um, one way to think about that is to look at her list, and I think it's online somewhere if people want to check it out, um, but but look at that list and, and think about it in relation to my character's goal. If they don't, like for example, if I don't make that person love me, what will I lose? Love, you know, which one's on this list am I going to lose? And if you, if you watch a lot of movies and you think about this and you think about the stakes that the writers have set up for their main characters, usually it's everything on that list except for one or two things. They stack the stakes for the main character. So it's just not love and belonging. It's also safety and security. It's also self-actualization. It's actually, you know, um, maybe later in the movie something happens where now it's survival. I'm going to die. They pile on the stakes. And every good writer has to be able to articulate what the character is going to lose if they don't get what they want. Again, everything is connected to the character and their goal. So if they don't get this thing, what will be lost? And the more you can stack those stakes for your character, the more tension and suspense um, and kind of like, we're just going to be like, oh no, they're not going to, if they, it's just going to create in the audience this like connection and fear that they're not going to get what they want, which is what you want in the story. So just like the, is it Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yeah. So I think at the, at the very bottom of it, or... Wait, I'm trying to think if I flipped it. So self-actualization, I think, is is the last one. Yes. It? And then survive safety 
That, and survival is yeah. the top. Okay. And L Linda mm -hmm. Seeger created the screenwriting version of that list. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so if you took like a Jenga piece, if we take one of those away, then that that's going to raise the stakes no matter what it is. Yeah. Character. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Like, like you know, um, I was thinking about um, the movie Coco, you know, the Pixar movie, Coco uh -huh. about the little kid, Miguel, who has to go to the land of the dead so he can find his ancestor so that he can become a musician, which is what he's meant to be, right? And I went through um, Linda Seeger's list of all those stakes, you know, um, and he had everything except one. And it, that's just good writing, you know. There, he's not just going to physically possibly die. He's going to lose his family. He's going to lose safety. He's going to um, not be who he's meant to be. Like everything. Like this kid, it's going to it's going to be horrible if he doesn't achieve his goal. Um, and so again, the writer has to be able to understand and articulate, you know, what's at stake for the character.